Hey everyone, welcome to Start Manga, where we're going to teach you everything you need to know about how to draw manga like a pro. Today, we're starting a brand new series called Every Drawing Ever, where basically I'm going to teach you every single thing I know and some things that I don't even know yet about how to draw so that eventually you can create your own manga series. Now this tutorial is going to be about how to draw gesture. Gesture is about drawing poses and capturing the energy of certain poses. So we're going to learn a lot about how to do that, as well as a bit of human anatomy and proportion. The way that I draw gesture comes from a book called Figure Drawing, Design and Invention. It's by Michael Hampton. He's a really great uh, art teacher or professor. I'll leave a link to the book in the description. It's really, really great, worth the read if you want a little more in-depth knowledge on how to draw the anatomy of these poses and also just more of his technique because I use a lot of what he does. So with all that out of the way, let's get into it. So the first thing we're going to look at is a couple techniques that are really, really important if we want to learn how to draw this way. The first is the types of curves that you're going to use. So let's take a look at this. Basically, there's three types of curves that you're always going to use with these types of drawings. The names of the curves are the C curve, which you can see at the top, the S curve from the middle here, and then the I curve at the bottom. And the I curve is just a straight line, obviously. So what these are useful for is if we're drawing really simple shapes or really simple figures like gesture, where we're not trying to include too much detail, we can really just draw it with these three shapes. We don't want to go too much in depth with the detail because if we add too much detail, it takes away from what we're trying to do, which is capture energy. Right? We're trying to capture where the pose is, what it's doing, and what it means. The story behind it is much more important than any details we can add like hands or feet or things like that. The next thing we're going to look at is symmetry. So there's obviously two different ways you can do symmetry. You can have symmetry or you can have asymmetry, which is obviously the opposite. The way that symmetry works is that we have this very straightforward path. It's very, very balanced and it just shows us the general idea of where something would be in this snowman position. Now this is a really simplified version of what symmetry is, but for example, it would be like if I drew a person straight on rather than drawing them in like an interesting pose. And even then, asymmetry is more accurate to a human because instead of going straight down, we're creating this curved path that we can follow. And what these are trying to do is just guide the eye of the viewer. So for example, we can look at the way that these guide the eye and see which one is better. This one, symmetry, we go down, but eventually we hit this stopping point. And we go down again and we hit this stopping point. And why is that happening? Well, because we have this shape that ends because of the symmetry. All right? If we have a shape where it sort of closes itself off, it's much less interesting than something that continues the motion. It's very more, much more energetic. It's much more energetic if we're using asymmetry. Now let's look at why symmetry is bad in comparison to asymmetry. Symmetry specifically has this cutoff when you're moving through the posing. So this cutoff comes because these shapes are closing themselves off as if they were like snowballs, for example, right? That closing off stops the viewer from moving on, right? If we change direction, they're gonna stop over here. They're gonna stop over here. We don't want the viewer's eye to stop. When we use asymmetry, it's continuous. There's no stopping points because every line of direction moves through the pattern, right? They're all going in their own sort of directions and it creates this very interesting flow of motion. So let's go back here, get rid of some of this. And I want to show you why balance is also a key feature. So just as a reminder, this is the path that we have here. Now this symmetry very much looks like a snowman. And the problem with a snowman is that we're getting this center of balance that makes sense, but it's boring, right? If we were looking at a person straight on, right? Even just a stick figure here. If I had a stick figure who's just being drawn straight on, he's got the pelvis, he's got his legs, feet right here. If I had a stick person like this, this is a boring pose, but even then, when he's in a boring pose, the human body does not work in this symmetrical shape because if I had the head here, I wouldn't just be going straight down right? There's different pathways that we can take that the human body goes through. So for example, if I start at the head, I might end up going this way. And then I'm going to look at the neck and then I'm going to look at the shoulder and I'm going to look at the upper arm and then I'm going to look at the lower arm and then I'm going to look at the hand. Everything is changing direction in ways that make sense for something that is such a chaotic uh, field of objects. And what's important to note is that when we're drawing the human body, we want to take that into account every single time we make a stroke. When we're drawing asymmetrically in terms of this balance, we create what's called a tower of chaos. And this tower of chaos, it doesn't necessarily have to get bigger, 
right? We could have two objects in here and then we can have another object. What it's doing is it's creating a path that follows this sort of motion that goes back and forth and doesn't stop. And the way that the human body works is that we have different shapes that stack on top of each other like this in very weird and interesting patterns that can change as you change the pose. So if we use symmetry, everything's gonna look really boring. It's gonna look really flat. If we use asymmetry, we're gonna get a much better feel for how the human body should actually be with this curvature. Now we're gonna look at the final technique that I want us to learn, which is wrapping lines. Wrapping lines are really, really simple. They're just trying to bring out the depth of the drawing. So for example, here I have these two shapes. What wrapping lines are are these little lines that go through the middle and they demonstrate the shape of the object in three-dimensional space. So we can see the lines are wrapping around the cylinder and they're wrapping around the cylinder in order to show us that the cylinder isn't flat. For example, if I drew a cylinder here, same sort of shape, right? If I just drew flat lines, it almost looks like the cylinder is a different shape. It looks as if the cylinder is flat in the middle and then there's these two circles that are around it, which obviously we don't want. We're not trying to shade in this case. We're not trying to create cross hatches. We're trying to create a wrapping line around the curvature so that we can see in 3D space where something is relative to the rest of its parts. What we're trying to do is wrap like a band and you can see here, this is just wrapping around this object right? Just goes around this object all the way around. And it's wrapping around it as if it's a tight rubber band that's really, really constricting the area so we can get the general idea of the shape. It's like a shrink wrap, for example, except it's only in certain parts. So if I was to draw it on this leg, for example, what I want to see is this wrap, right? And I can only do, I, I don't have to do it in one line, but this makes it easier. I'm trying to wrap around the figure. And because I've wrapped around the figure, we can sort of get the idea of the cylindrical shape rather than just that flat 2D object. Same thing if I go further down, I wanna wrap a little bit more and then I can wrap around the ankle, for example. I can also add a few more that are just a little bit lighter if I want to. And this gives us the general idea of the shapes that we're looking at. Okay, now that we've gone through all the major techniques that we're gonna need, we're gonna look at the proportions and the anatomy of the bodies that we're gonna be drawing. So there's six major components that we're gonna draw. First is the head, then comes the spine, which you'll be able to draw as a shape of the back, usually. The rib cage, which is usually just a shape of the front of the drawing, a long curve. Then we have the pelvis, the legs, and then the arms. With those six shapes, you can draw anybody without having to go into too much detail because they're all the biggest parts of the human body. We're not gonna worry about musculature, we're not gonna worry about hands or feet, we're just worrying about the major shapes and the overall energy of the pose so we know what it would look like if someone was in that position. Before we get into the proportions, I wanna take a look at the spine specifically because the spine dictates the shape of the body. So there's three components to the spine and I'm just gonna draw one out quickly. Make it a little cleaner here. So this is the general shape of the spine. This is not exact. And the spine inserts into the back of the head just underneath here. So if we had our head facing in this profile view in this direction, the spine has three components that we wanna focus on. The cervical, the thoracic, and the lumbar. And you can divide those shapes into very, very simple curves. The ones that we used before, they can all be turned into C curves. So for example, let me just change my color so you can see this more accurately. The cervical spine looks like this, from this angle, you can see it, it curves in this direction. The thoracic spine curves like this. It goes back out opposite to where the rib cage would be. So for example, if I had a rib cage in here, which is a general shape, you can see that the spine goes behind it. Right, I can have it like, this. I think that's a better way of putting it. So because we have these sections of the spine, we can divide it into three main curves, the cervical curve, thoracic curve, and the lumbar curve. Now this doesn't necessarily mean that you're always going to have these curves, but most of the time, if you're seeing the body from almost any angle, you can tell where the spine would be aligned. And that allows you to choose where the pelvis would tilt, where the rib cage would tilt, where your legs are probably gonna be in relation to it because the spine controls movement. If the spine is in a certain position, you can generally judge where things should be, at least in terms of the torso. 
So just as an example to show you the asymmetry here, we have this arrow, this arrow, and this arrow. Very, very simple. And if we wanted to draw the glute, for example, we could draw another arrow back here. This would be the quad right here. We would have the back of the leg right there. And you can see it continues down very, very simply until we get to the legs. So let me just get rid of all that. And I'll move this over here so we have it as a reference when we go through proportions. So for now, this is gonna sit right here. Now let's go through some basic proportions. The human body is around eight heads tall. Now it's usually in real life around seven and a half, but this is a decent measure so we don't have to cut any corners. Eight heads is a really, really simple measurement that we can use to figure out the proportions. And if we line up the parts of our body with these eight heads, we can see the bottom of the chin sits at the top of the first head, so we know it's around the same size. This bottom of the middle of the rib cage here switch my color back to red sits around halfway on the third head and the elbows are generally around the same spot not exactly in the same place but generally they line up in similar spots the pelvis is about a head tall or so which it's surprisingly big considering what you would imagine the pelvis to be especially i made this a male figure and the male pelvis is usually a bit smaller but it lines up at about the top of the fourth head and then the tops of the femurs the upper leg bone sits in the middle of the body at the same place as the bottom of the pelvis. The wrist also sits at this position, so it's really important to keep in mind that it lines up with these two other elements. Especially when you're drawing arms up in the air, it's a good way to tell proportion. Now when we're drawing the legs, we want to show the curvature of the femur. So the femur tends to move in, and then we move back out a little bit, and then we move back in again. When we're drawing this lower leg, you can see it sort of curves back and brings us to the ankle. Very, very important to keep that in mind because it's important in terms of how we draw from different angles. If I were drawing the calf from the front, for example, I can draw it as these two lines, very simply. And it just gives me a general idea of where the leg would be. Now, obviously this is a very extreme angle and the leg doesn't actually look like this, but it just makes it easier for someone to understand where the leg would look from that angle. If I change the angle and I was drawing the leg from the side, for example, quad would go right there and then I draw the calf we wouldn't have that same extreme angle necessarily because we don't need it, right? We could draw it that way, but we don't necessarily need to. This adds a bit of an artistic dynamic flair as well, which I really, really like the look up, but it's up to you whether you use it. So we have, I'm gonna redraw these angles. We have one right here and one right here. And then we have the foot. The foot usually goes about a third up, of, uh, up the last head or about halfway, depending on how tall you want them to be. It really doesn't matter so long as it's generally accurate. Right? And when we're making these drawings, we don't want to make measurements. We never, ever, ever want to draw out all the heads and really, really go through it, unless it's your first time ever doing this, because then it might help you to draw the figure better. But it's better practice to look at the figure and just try to judge the proportion. Because if you judge the proportion, it's easier over time to learn where certain things should line up, what certain things should look like. It builds up your repertoire of visual knowledge. All right, now we've got all that out of the way, so we're gonna move on to actually drawing someone in gesture. We're gonna take a pose, a really dynamic pose, and just work through it step by step until we can get the whole gesture drawing done. So let's get into it. So now we have our techniques figured out. We're gonna get into drawing our gesture. So I have this very nice pose here taken by David Hoffman on Unsplash. All we're gonna do is we're gonna start at the head. So beginning at the head, I like to draw a little circle and then create a shape for my jaw. And don't worry about scratchy lines or anything, but keep them long if you can. Now we're gonna move into the spine. I can't see the back of the spine here, but I know it's there. So I'm gonna draw this shape just so I have it. And then for the thoracic spine, that middle section, that one that curves back out, I'm gonna use the lat muscle here as my example part because I can't actually see it very well. I know it's there, but this shows more of the shape of the body, which I like to show off. So make it really, really extreme. We're gonna show off that shape here. Just a couple lines there. And then we're gonna curve back. And we know we curve back at the lumbar spine. So we're gonna curve where we think it would show up, which is about there. 
actually I'm gonna make it a little more extreme. We wanna really, really show off the pose. Anytime we're drawing gesture, we're trying to show the story of that drawing, the story of the pose, and the energy that that pose is conveying. Really, really keep that in mind. So now that we have this shape, I wanna draw in the rib cage. And the rib cage, obviously, you can see it's like this big ovular shape right here. But we're gonna draw all the way down to the stomach line. So I'll draw one big line. I like to draw one big C curve to really show off. Yeah, there we go, that's something nice. To really, really show off the shape that we're trying to convey. And it doesn't matter if these lines intersect, I might change things up a little bit after a while, but it doesn't matter too much. All right, actually, let me open it up because I don't want to cut off the viewer's eye. Just a little bit of erasing right there, get rid of that end point. See, it's like it never happened. So now what we're gonna do is add in the glute, All right? And then after we add in the glute, we're gonna first go into our supporting leg and then draw in our accessory leg. Now our supporting leg doesn't exist here because obviously this person is off the ground, but this is what I would consider the dominant leg because it's much more visible and it's in the front of the body. So I'm gonna start by drawing a general shape for the quad. Right, and I just wanna use one line when I'm really, really getting a form in. I'm not trying to draw every single quad muscle. I'm not trying to show off any shape like that. I'm just trying to get in the general idea of where the front of the leg is. Then I'm gonna move into the calf. So the calf comes in this big S curve for me most of the time. I usually use an S curve, All right? It doesn't have to be exact. All right, so it curves out a little bit this way, curves in this way, and then curves out again. And then right here, we'd be at the foot. So for the foot, I like to do just a couple straight lines to demonstrate where it would be. There's nothing too complex in the foot right now because we don't need that complexity. We just need shape. Now we're gonna go back up into the leg. All right, and don't worry about intersecting lines too much. So long as you have your asymmetry here, so this leg, go, this leg line goes this way and this leg line curves back, you're gonna have a nice shape to your drawing. And then finally, I like to add in a little bit of curvature for the hamstrings if I'm at a side angle like this, just to show it off. It doesn't have to be too complex, All right, just a small curve to end off the leg shape. All right, you can see now that we have this shape in, we're really getting the idea of where the pose would be. At this stage, I like to add in some wrapping lines because it's hard to tell where the person is actually facing. From this angle, it looks like they're facing straight to the side, but we can see that their belly button is visible, which means that they're actually facing a little bit towards us, just the tiniest bit, right? They'd be looking like there, right? This little curve to the arrow shows you that they're facing a little bit towards us, okay? So what that means is that we can draw in a little belly button. I like to draw in a little belly button just as a reference point so I know where they're facing because it makes it easier for me to decide where the wrapping lines are gonna go. You can see I'm drawing in my wrapping lines pretty densely because I wanna have a good idea of where the shapes are. So here we can see the chest is facing up. It's facing up here. I'm gonna demonstrate that here. It's facing up. Really, really facing up in that direction. So what I want to do is create a wrap that follows this. We have this wrap. This one sort of goes here. We're going to have one on the midsection. And the midsection faces down now. So we're changing our direction. It's going to be facing this way now. And the pelvis can have this little line around it. That's all we need. We only need those few, few lines in order to demonstrate the shapes that we're trying to convey. So these ones face up. And these ones will face sort of down, out, away from the body. So we'll do one on the stomach here. We don't need two too much. If I could only get the lines in the right spot. And then we're going to have one for the pelvis. So we can really, really show off that shape. Now we're going to go into the leg. The leg is really simple. I just want to follow the curvature that I see in the leg here. And then for the knee, we don't really have to worry about it. If you want to draw in a bit more of a dynamic knee sh shape, that's totally fine. Not important though. And then we can draw on the calf. And the calf in this case is facing generally the same direction. So I usually do one for the upper part of the upper leg, the lower part of the upper leg, around where the knee would be just below it maybe, and then around the ankle. And that shows off perfectly where the shape of the leg is without distorting any of its pathways. By pathways, I mean the abstract lines that we use. 
Next, we're going to draw on the other leg. So the other leg starts at the front of the pelvis here, sort of goes out like this. And remember, it's further away from the camera, so it's going to look a tiny bit smaller than the other leg, but nothing that really changes the shape overall. Now we have a special case here where the knee is bent, right? It's completely bent. And what that means is I can add in another line for just the knee if I really want to. And I tend to do that. So I'll add in a little knee line that curves around here. Now, once we've got that knee shape in, we're going to draw in the calf. The calf is a really simple shape. Once again, it's just this curve. Just want to get it in the right spot. I might actually draw in the hamstring a bit, just so we have a reference point. And then we're going to draw in the calf. I don't want to draw it too big, because in comparison to the other calf, it should be around the same size. Yeah, there we go. That's a much better shape. That's what I was looking for. Sometimes you're going to be spending a lot of time trying to get these overlaying lines. Let me get one for the hamstring too. There we go. And then I draw in a shape for the foot. I like to do straight lines once again. Draw in something like that. And then just a straight line. We'll go like this. Something like that is all you really need. And then we'll add in our wrapping lines. So we'll have this shape continue all the way down. Get a wrap here. One near the knee, one for the top of the calf. Actually, the top of the calf is going this way, so let's demonstrate that. And I'm noticing here that our ankle is a little bit wide, so I'm going to make a correction. Now remember, you can always make corrections to these drawings. There's nothing really wrong with doing that. This might take you a little bit longer if you go that route. So we add in that line again, make it a little bit thinner at the bottom, have our calf. Perfect. We have a nice leg shape right here. It's not exact. As you can see, the gap here is a lot bigger, but it gives the idea of the pose, and that's all you really need. And then finally, once we have all this in, we've shown our direction, we're going to add in the arm here. And the arm comes in three general shapes. We're going to have the shoulder, which I hope you guys can see that right there, the shoulder. We have the humerus, which goes through the middle of the upper arm, stops at the elbow. And then we have the top of the forearm, which is the brachialis muscle. After the brachialis, we can just add in a hand. So either you can add in the actual shape of the hand if you want to, but you don't have to. You can also just add in an arrow. That's what I usually do because the hand is not important to showing the shape of the drawing, whereas the feet tend to show a sense of balance so you can draw a triangle for them. The hand is just for energy and direction. So when drawing the hand over here, or the arm I mean, we're going to add in the shoulder. We can see the shoulder sort of clips near the head, so we're going to have the shoulder pretty high up, right around there. We're going to add in the humerus, same spot we had it over there. Start that again. Let's make the humerus right there. And then we're going to add in the upper forearm. And then for the hand, like I said, you can just add in an arrow. And you can see we get the general shape. We have this curvature that shows us where the arm would go. You can add in a bit of wrap. Right? And as it's approaching the camera, you can see these lines get more and more flat instead of curvy because that's the direction of the arm. And then just to add a few details whenever I want to, I add in some straight lines. This is not a necessary step. Once you're at this point, you're basically done your gesture. Everything I do from this point is just extra to make it look a little bit nicer. So I add in some straight lines. Anywhere that I feel like would look better with a little bit more detail. All right, or I might add in a couple of curves if I really feel like it. Here I'm adding in a little bit of a curve for the neck just so you can see it. And I don't really think there's anywhere else I need an extra curve. So I would say this is pretty much done. All right, now that we've got all of that done, we've learned all our techniques, we've learned our proportions, and we've seen a full example, I'm gonna go through a few more examples in a time lapse. So enjoy.
All right, and with that, we are done. We finished all of our examples. I've given you guys a few more just so you could see some angles and the different ways that I've drawn different shapes. Today, you've learned how to draw gesture, how to capture the energy of a pose, and I really, really hope this helps in your art journey and learning how to draw people and anatomy. If you like this video and you want to see more tutorials just like this, please leave a like and subscribe so you're ready for the next one. All right, guys, take care.